Psalm 1, 1, 9. And we'll be reading verse 117. Psalm 119, verse 117. Hold me up that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. Hold me up that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. Let us pray. O oh God, our God, our King, our shield, our defender, our father, our master, our Lord. We have come this evening to listen to the preaching of your word and to receive directly from you that which you would have us here tonight. Oh, we ask that you open our eyes to see wondrous things in your law that our hearts may be warmed, and that we may live here tonight, touched, spoken to, that our hearts may be walked upon by your Spirit through your Word. In Jesus' name. Hold me up that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. The famous Baptist preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon once told a story. A mother once met her boy and told him, John, you have broken one of the Ten Commandments. And the boy looked up at the mother and he said, Mother, those commandments are awfully easy. To break. The Ten Commandments are awfully easy to break. You see, that child had discovered something poignant about man. For us children of Adam, sin is a very easy thing to do. Sinning comes to us naturally. We don't have to think to sin. We don't have to act. We don't have to plan to sin. Sin is like water that comes out of a fountain or water that flows from a spring. That's how sin flows from us. And our reaction to this truth matters because we can either reject it or choose to ignore it or we can accept it. I know a Christian man who once taught himself to be above certain kinds of sins. And what he told himself, basically, in his mind, was that I've worked with God for so long. And I, I mean, I'm so consistent. My prayer life is on point. I speak to somebody at least every now and then about God. I give regularly. I'm disciplined. And so certain sins that our baby sins are beneath me. Until one day that this Christian man fell into one of those baby sins, those so-called baby sins. Perhaps you're like that Christian man, and once you hear that brother A or brother B did this or that, the first thing that comes to your mind is, how could he do it? How could she do it? Are they even Christians? Can I even call them Christians? Perhaps you have, like that Christian man, built a kind of confidence in your own self-discipline. You are upright, basically. If we're going to check your own record this past week, you have, you have been consistent. You read your Bible every day. You prayed every day. Not that these things are not bad. Actually, Christians should do these things. 
but you have begun to build a kind of confidence in those things. And you think you can never fall into baby sins. If you're like that, the psalmist has something to say to you tonight. On the other hand, you may be a Christian who has lost all hope, as it were, in your walk with God when it comes to certain sins or certain habits. You may have said to yourself that this thing is above me. That after all, as long as I have been justified, I will be glorified. Hence, if I fall on Monday, or I fall on Tuesday, or I fall on Wednesday, it doesn't really matter. And if you are like that also, perhaps at the point of despair, confusion, and you have been overwhelmed by sin, David has something to say to you tonight as well. Tradition tells us that this entire 119 psalm was written by the man David. And tradition also tells us that David wrote this psalm as a means of teaching his son Solomon the Hebrew alphabet. If you observe closely, the psalm is made up of 176 verses broken into 22 subsections because the Hebrew letters are 22. The Hebrew alphabet, 22. And the tradition also tells us that beyond just teaching Solomon A, B, C to Z, he wanted to also teach Solomon the alphabet of the spiritual life. Now, whether that tradition is true or not, the fact remains that when we come to our text tonight, we see that this psalmist has come to a vital and essential understanding of something about himself as a man and about his condition. And it is because he has realized this thing about himself that he was able to cry out to God, hold me up. So the verse we're considering essentially is a prayer of a man who has come to understand something about himself, that has come to understand that he's not as solid as he thinks or has he thought he used to be. It's a prayer of a man who has come to the point of utter helplessness and who is lifting up his voice to heaven and crying out, Lord, hold me up. The first thing we can note about this text is that there is a sense of fear and trepidation in the heart of this man. There is a sense of fear when he says, hold me up that I may be safe. There's an implied sense of danger that this man has sensed. You see, as Christians in this world, we have much to fear. I think that Christian is a fool who thinks that there is nothing to fear here on earth. When we consider the temptations that constantly assail us, brothers, sisters, we have much to fear. We only need to breathe to be assaulted by temptation. We don't even have to go to look for temptation. The moment we wake up from our very first opening of our eyes every morning, temptations assail us. The devil, the Bible tells us, our adversary, is constantly looking for whom to devour. And Satan would often appeal to the lust of our flesh. You see, he knows how to get us. Legitimate desires that God has given to us, the devil would want us to seek those things illegitimately. Remember he came to Eve in the Garden of Eden and brought the fruit and asked Eve, has God said? And the Bible tells us that the moment Eve noticed that that which was forbidden was good for food, she took out of it and ate. And the time when our Lord was fasting in Matthew chapter 4, the devil went to meet him. I said, if you are the son of God, turn the stones to become bread. Hunger in and of itself is not a bad thing. But what the devil often does is this. He wants us to satisfy that hunger in illegitimate ways. So the devil constantly comes against us, presenting us with food and drink and sex and pleasure. All of them in their rightful places, blessings from God. But he does this to the end that we may sin against God. 
that we may disregard the law of God, basically, and pursue these things in our own way. Not just that. The devil knows how to bring appealing sights to us. The Bible tells us in Judges chapter 14, and this is where the problem of Samson came about, that he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Had Samson not seen, perhaps he would not have fallen. But Samson saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. The hymn writer talks about the, the dazzling sights I see. So the devil would do this sometimes to us. He would put those things he knows are sure to get us that would appeal to our eyes. Eve, we're told in Genesis chapter 3, saw that the tree was a delight to our eyes. And the devil also tried this with our Lord. He took him up to the mountains and said, see all the kingdoms of the world. See all of these things. Bow down and it'll be yours. What the devil does, basically, is he brings these sights that dazzle. These tempting things that appeal to our sensuality. He brings them to us, knowing that we would love to see them. And perhaps no age has suffered from this as much as our ours. We are the iPhone and the social media age. And every day on social media, we are bombarded with these things. Constantly. From sex to the things we want to have. I mean, people spend hours on the internet, not because they are working, but because they are looking at the life they wish they would have. They are looking at the husband they wish they had. They're looking at the wife they wish they had, or the house they wish they had, or the family they wish they had. And the devil knows how to put all of these things in place, you see, to the end that the people of God would fall into temptation. Not just that. The devil knows how to get us to pursue the things that would make us show off, basically. He asked the Lord to throw himself down. Remember in Matthew chapter 4, he said, cast yourself down. And of course, you are the son of God. Cast yourself down. And he quoted scripture. And said, he said he will give his angels charge over you. And you will not strike your foot against the rock. And when Eve saw as well that the tree would make her wise, she took out her hand and tried to get it. So we see these three things. And how the devil constantly tries to trip us off through the lust of our flesh, the lust of our eyes, and the pride of our life. In light of these things, is there any Christian who would not fear? More than that, when we consider the corruption that lies within our own hearts, you see, Satan would not have power over you if not that he has an ally within you. Satan will have no power over us if not that he has something he sure would respond to his advances. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6 that yes, we have been freed from the dominion of sin. Sin cannot have dominion over us. But the Bible also tells us that we have indwelling sin. And because of that remaining corruption, because of that remaining corruption, oh, the devil has large success sometimes over us. The hymn writer says, prone to wonder, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. The devil is not trying to make me wonder. The problem is stemming from my own heart. That my heart is not as steady as it should be. That my heart is not as fixed upon the Lord as it should be. That the remaining sin that is left in me constantly, when I want to do good, evil is with me. When I want to serve God, evil is with me. When I want to do the legitimate things, even in the legitimate ways, the remaining corruption of my heart fails me. In light of this, should we not be afraid? Also, when we consider the Christians that have gone before us, mighty men who have fallen, should we not be afraid? In 1 Samuel chapter 13, the Bible tells us that David was a man after God's heart. And when I read that text, you know what I ask myself? Why did God not say this about any other person? Why was it said particularly about this son of Jesse? Yet it was this David, the one who was loved by God, the one who was after God's heart, that took his hand 
and stole another man's wife. The Bible tells us in 1 Kings chapter 3 that Solomon loved the Lord and he walked in the ways of his father, David. And when I think upon the life of Solomon, I am amazed. Because for 20 years, the Bible tells us, Solomon walked upon the temple and upon his house. And for those 20 years, there was no issue that God had to correct in the life of Solomon. He was walking uprightly. He was walking well. But then in 1 Kings chapter 11, just two chapters later, after that, we're told that Solomon had gotten a thousand women to keep him company. When we think of great men, even contemporary men who have fallen, we have reason to be afraid. Now, when I read the news of Ravi Zacharias a few, many months back, you know, the first question I asked myself, if Ravi could fall, who else would not fall? If Ravi could not stand, who else would stand? And I told myself, oh, how difficult it is indeed for a man to keep his ways pure. You see, this writer has had a sense of this danger. He has sensed it. He has come to understand this. And something is moving in his heart. And as he thinks upon these things, he says, Oh Lord, hold me up. When he comes to see that in light of the temptation the devil would send his way, in light of his own inward corruption, and perhaps of the men, mighty men of God who had fallen, oh, he was scared. And he had to lift up his voice and say, Lord, hold me up. Friends, no man or woman can live the Christian life if the Lord does not uphold him. Severed from God, we fall. Samson was a mighty man so long as he had the locks on his head, so long as he kept the Nazarene vows. Oh, all Samson had to do was to lose communion with God, and Samson fell face flat on the ground. You see, without God holding us up, some of us think we're good people. But I tell you, we're going to just release his hand for one instant. We would, con- we, would, we would conceive of the most terrible of sins. These are minds. These are sanctified minds that are singing good songs. We would commit the most heinous of sins. We're going to leave us to ourselves. We're going to leave us to ourselves. We will bring disrepute to the name of Christ. We're going to leave us to ourselves, we would act in such an abominable manner. Which is why we ought to cry out to God, hold me up. Hold me up. I see the temptations, hold me up. I see my own weakness, and I see the wickedness of my heart, hold me up. And when I look around me, I look around me, you know, I like to talk about sometimes about the young restless and reformed movement. And many of these men who fell out of the faith, basically, from this movement were used by God. They were used by God. When I say they were used by God, some of them preached and hundreds of people came to the faith through their ministries. They were used by God. But when we look at the tragic end of many of their ministries, I wonder if all of us and not to cry out, Lord, hold me up. And see, God is so merciful to us that he has devised many means to hold us up. He holds us up sometimes through the preaching of the word. So that whereas we would be senseless, he gives us the preaching of his word week after week, Sunday after Sunday, that we might be held up. And he gives us his word even to us in a language we can understand. That through the reading of his word on a daily basis, we might be held up. He gives us the sacraments. He gives us the Lord's Supper. He gives us baptism so that constantly grace will be communicated to our souls that he might hold us up. He even gives us the ministry of angel who, who we are told in Hebrews chapter 1 are ministering spirits sent to those of us who are inheritors of salvation that he might hold us up. Sometimes the Lord would even send severe discipline Discipline, just that he might hold us up. And sometimes he will send suffering, sickness, so that he might hold us up. You know what this tells me? That God is so gracious and we are so weak. 
that God has to make so many means available to hold us up. Oh, how weak and helpless we are. You know, sometimes we boast, some of us, that we are prayer warriors. And I said, God, put prayer there because you are weak. Yes, prayer is there because we are weak. And we can do nothing on our own. And we are utterly helpless people. And that's why God gave us the gift of prayer. God has made all these means available that he might keep us and hold us up. However, prayer really, in the last analysis, are inverted promises. That God has promised to hold us up, gives us the assurance to cry out to him, Lord, hold us up. That God has given us in the pages of scripture precious promises that he will be our God, that he will hold us up, that he will be with us, he will be our strength, he will be our great reward. We can cry out to him and say, Lord, hold me up. But then the psalmist also gives us the result of this holding up. Hold me up that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. He identifies two results from God's upholding of his child. First, I will be safe. I will be safe. You see, should God hold a man up, that man will really be safe from harm. You see, for many of us seated down here, many of the bruises and injuries we have gotten in life came because we were unable to keep ourselves upright. Some of us are suffering from sins of 10 years ago, some from sins of 20 years ago, and there are certain actions, perhaps you even took just once, just once, and for decades the consequences are still following you. Look at King David. When he took Bathsheba, in, I believe in his heart, what he thought was, this is just a one-time thing. Of course, he did it multiple times, obviously. But do you know that when he was running away from Absalom, that was the result of his sin with Bathsheba? Because when the prophet came, the prophet told him, David, that because of this thing you have done, the sword shall not depart from your house. And all of a sudden, boom, his children are crazy. And Amnon slept with Tamar. And Absalom killed Amnon. And Absalom fled. And Absalom came back. And David was fleeing. And Absalom died. All the bruises he encountered towards the end of his life. In fact, before he died, another of his sons stood up and wanted to take the kingdom at Donija. When God holds us up, we would really be safe from harm. I'm talking about physical harm even. I'm talking about the, the things that come as the natural consequences of our actions. Should God hold us up, we would really be safe from harm. Also, should God hold us up, we will be safe from grievous sins. From grievous sins. Sins are not the same. Certain sins are more grievous than others. Of course, as believers, we believe this, that we are not sinless, which means whether consciously or unconsciously, we do sin every day, one way or the other. Even if it is just a sin of thought, an ungodly thought passes through your mind, you're complaining against the goodness of God. That's sin, of course. But there's grievous sin. The kind that God needs to prevent us from falling into. I think of the man Jonah of Tarshish. Jonah fleeing to Tarshish rather. And as Jonah was already fleeing, he was already in sin. But I count it as God's mercy that he sent a storm. Lest his prophet fell into greater sin. And sometimes this is what God will do for us. We've done it one time. One time. And he's merciful to us. And he sends us a storm like he sends Jonah, just to stop us in our tracks. If God were, is to hold us up, we will be prevented from grievous sin. Outside the holding of God, I, I'm just imagining what would have happened to Jonah. Perhaps that guy would have left entirely. Because even on the ship where the storm was going on, Jonah could not pray. And I wonder, if God had not sent the fish, had not sent the storm, if God had not providentially put all these things together, and he found himself in the bottom, in the belly of the sea. Ah, I wonder if he would have cried out to God. If he would have said, salvation belongs to God. If God would hold us up, friends, 
he will be saved from grievous sins. If God would hold us up, we'll be saved. Finally, even. Because the Bible tells us that we have been saved and we are being saved. And in the process of our sanctification, we are being purified daily by his spirit working in us. For us to be saved finally, God has to hold us up. Because when Jesus said, he that endures to the end shall be saved, he's not saying it for us to think, oh, okay, that means every person who will be saved for eternity would endure himself by himself. No, God has to hold us and keep us and preserve us. Oh, that God will hold us up. Oh, that we'll be able to cry out to him, to tell him to hold us up. And when God keeps us safe, it is not to the end that we become careless. Because look at the second half of the verse. It says, and I will have regard for your statutes continually. Hold me up that I may be safe. And when I am safe, I will have regard for your statutes continually. What the psalmist is saying is this, that I'll be more sensitive to your law. I'll be more conscious of your law. I'll be more careful to keep your commands if you would hold me up. If God is not to hold us up, I'm telling you, we will be like that boy who told his mother, the commandments of God are awfully easy to break. Because in every second, we are breaking the commands of God. Every minute, we're going to be breaking the command of God. Every single day, we're going to be breaking the commands of God, but for God's holding us up. It is when God holds us up that we can take his word, basically, and hide it in our hearts and not sin against him. Friends, there's little reason for us to be self-confident in the Christian life. There's little reason for us to think that in ourselves we possess that which we need to hold ourselves. Ah, the Bible shows us constantly, and not just the Bible, church history shows us constantly that when God removes his hand from men, oh, they are terrible. They are terrible. And if God were to do this to us, even for a single day, oh, we'll do terrible, terrible things. And if you're like that man who is self-confident, you have much reason to fear. And your fear should stem from the fact that you can't hold yourself. You can't hold yourself. If you could, I mean, every other person who has gone before you would have. But you can't hold yourself. And then you must cry out to God, hold me up. But perhaps you're in the second category, the one who thinks that, I mean, I can't, I can't defeat this sin. I can't defeat this problem, this challenge, this difficulty. Do not feel overpowered, overwhelmed. You can hold on to the promises of God. He is the one who said that he will not sleep, he will not slumber. The one who keeps you will neither slumber nor sleep. He will keep you from all evil. He will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. You can hold on to the promises of God. As you're stepping into the new week, you may be aware of difficulty, even at work. And you may be aware of the fact that if God does not hold you, you're going to compromise, even this week. You're aware of the pressure. And you know you've seen a way out. That if only I would do this, 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 this. If I would do this, this way, or do this that way, I, I would be free. I would, I would get relief. You're aware that if perhaps you touch some figures here and there, you'll be better off. Or if you say certain things, you pander to certain people's opinions. If you to just compromise a bit here, or a bit there, you're, you're going to be okay. You can cry out to God tonight, even as you step into the new week, that Lord hold me up with the pressure on your shoulders. Even from, for some of us, it may be coming from family. You've been told perhaps that if you don't do this in this way, you're going to be cut off from this family. If you don't do things this way, you're going to lose certain of your inheritances. You're going to lose certain privileges you're enjoying. You can cry out to God, hold me up. You're feeling, you're, you're in an unavoidable circumstance, an, an unavoidable situation, and you, you can't run away from it. There are things like that in our life. You can't run away from it. You either go forward or you go forward. But you can cry out to God that even in that situation that I find myself in, Lord, hold 
me up. That outside the grace of Christ, I would bring utter disregard to your name. I would bring dishonor to your name. Lord, hold me up. Or you may not even be going through difficulty. You may be going through a season of prosperity. The market is booming. The, the something is going high now. Or sales are going well. But you can't cry to God, hold me up. Because it is in seasons of prosperity even that the devil comes against us. It was when Joseph found himself in a prosperous environment that the a Potiphar's wife could rise up. The psalmist teaches us not only that we are helpless, that we are utterly helpless. And in light of the danger, and in light of the troubles, and in light of the difficulty that constantly comes with the Christian life, we can do nothing without God's upholding. And so, my charge to us tonight is to cry out to God, hold me up on a daily basis. Hold me up. Even when we fall in multiple times, oh, turn back to him and ask him, hold me up. And the beautiful thing about prayer, Charles Spurgeon said, God has promised to hear prayer and he will perform his promise. Prayer sometimes is the most senseless thing to do, but it's the most powerful thing a man can do. I can't remember the Puritan who said this. He said, you can do much after you pray, but you can do nothing before you pray. So we can cry out to God in difficulty, in struggle, under fierce temptations, under serious trials, under serious affliction, under serious pain in our bodies, under serious confusion, under serious lack and want. We can cry out to God tonight, Lord, hold me up. And he would hear us. He would hear us. He promises to hear our prayers. So let us approach the throne of grace boldly and cry out for help, to find grace to help and obtain mercy in our time of need. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, oh, how great is our need. Oh, how great is our need. When we look at ourselves and we look at our own abilities, we do not see that which we need really in ourselves. We know of our own weaknesses. We know of our frailty. We know of how easy it is for us to sin. We know of the kind of pleasure we take even sometimes in sinning. We know of the compromise, the lies in our lives. Lord, we cry out to you tonight to have mercy upon us and that you hold us up. Like the psalmist, we've recognized that in ourselves, we do not have that which we need to keep ourselves in you, to keep ourselves faithful, to keep ourselves loving you and seeking after you. So Lord, we cry out tonight, hold us up. Hold us up, O God, that we may be safe and that we may pay regard to your commandments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.